kilo. Ay, yeah. Clutch. I'm in the clutch, we in the clutch, the team up in clutch. You think that we suck, your dreams are the luck, your ship is just sunk, we turn out for what? Ooh, yeah. See that my face is up in disgust because people talking a mess, but there's nothing to discuss. I'm just being honest, I'm keeping it a bug. Uh huh. We in the clutch! What's going down, Clutch Squat? What up, what up, what up? It's your boy Duck. It's your boy Ross. And we are in the Clutch. Hey, hey. back to you, ladies and gentlemen, another visit today, you feel me? Top three stories that sound fake, but are 100% real. Part five, man. Damn. It's been a minute since we checked out some Mr. Ballin. I think the last time we checked out a Mr. Ballin video was before we was dealing with the strikes. Yeah. Which was like a few months back and then as of recently. So we had checked one out, but we're back for you guys. We're back. These videos are always mind blowing and we're always like usually just lost for words and you guys love watching it with us as well. So sure. Make sure you go subscribe to Mr. Ballin because these videos and the way he tells the story Definitely dope are marriage. very dope. We are, are we even subscribed? Are we telling other people to subscribe? We gotta make sure, we gotta subscribe to him, man. Yeah, man, shout out to Mr. Ballin for creating some cool content. Nah, these stories, man, are really dope. Like the way he narrates and tells the story mm -hmm. is even more interesting, bro, because you know, it, it, you can tell a story, anybody can tell a story, but somebody that narrates it the way yeah. he does with the details and the interest in it keeps you entertained and yeah. flowing the whole time. So. Let's stop talking. Let's get into this part five. Yeah. The story is so wildly improbable that if there wasn't footage, nobody would believe it happened. Uh oh. Luckily, I've been a lot of stories would be like that. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload mm. three or four times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please sneak into the like button's house and steal all of their <laughs> stuff. Like also, like please that. subscribe to our channel and turn on all subscribe notifications him, so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Subscribe all right, let's get into yeah, today's stories. Mr. Ballin! Ballin! Oh, Ooh, Dr. Who like the show reference. Dr. Who? In 1974, Jean-Claude Romand enrolled in medical school in Lyon, France. He was a model student who excelled despite the notoriously brutal course load. In 1980, he married his girlfriend, and shortly after that, they had two kids, a boy and a girl. In okay. 1983, he officially became a doctor and landed a great job as a researcher at the World Health Organization in Geneva. His focus was on finding new medicines to treat arteriosclerosis, also mm. known as heart disease. His mm. wife would proudly tell her friends that her husband was a super doctor who worked quietly in a neon lit lab in Geneva to develop all these incredible treatments. From the outside looking in, Jean-Claude's life looked perfect, yeah. but looks can be deceiving. As in the early morning source. hours of Monday, January 11th, 1993, Jean-Claude's best friend, Luke, received a call informing him there had been a terrible accident. In the night, a boiler had caught fire inside of Jean-Claude's house, killing Damn. his wife and his children. Oh, Jean-Claude no. had barely escaped alive, but when he got to the hospital, he had slipped into a coma. The two men had been friends for nearly 20 years. They were both doctors. They had both gotten married at almost the exact same time. Their kids had grown up together. And now Jean-Claude's family had been completely destroyed. Sad. Later that day, when Luke arrived at the hospital to see his friend, he was met with two policemen standing outside of his room, barring anyone from going inside. Uh -oh. And when they realized Luke was his best friend, the policeman said, hey, can we actually pull you aside and talk to you about Jean-Claude? And so Luke was confused, but he walked over and sat at a table with the two officers. And they proceeded to tell him that the fire that had killed Jean-Claude's family had not been an accident. And Jean-Claude was not a doctor. Jean-Claude had enrolled in medical school in Lyon back in the 1970s, but he failed to show up for his first year exam. And without passing that exam, you can't advance in medical school. Mm -hmm. And so the school allowed him to retake the year. And so Jean-Claude did that for 12 consecutive years. What? All the while, he told his friends and family that he was following normal medical studies. And eventually he told them he had become a doctor. Instead of going to Geneva to discover new medicines for heart disease, Jean-Claude would drive around the border area between France and Switzerland and periodically go to the World Health Organization's public information center and would just walk around the lobby and read pamphlets before going home again. What? When Jean-Claude went on overseas business trips, he would actually just leave his house, hop on the highway, and stop at a motel, stay there for a couple of days, and then return with gifts. He lived off money from the sale of his student apartment in Lyon that his parents had bought for him. When the money ran out, he asked his friends and family to give him their life savings so he could invest them into these schemes that he knew about because he was a UN employee. And because he's this very successful, reputable doctor, people agreed and gave him their money. Oh, but no. by late 1992, some of his victims were asking for their money, and he didn't have it. 
And so some of these people began doing some research on Jean-Claude, and they found his name was not listed on the World Health Organization staff list. Right. By January of 1993, Jean-Claude knew it was only a matter of time before he was exposed. And to this point, he has been living this lie for almost 20 years. His wife, his kids, his friends, his parents, everybody, Damn. he has told that he's the successful That's a doctor. Long time. And it's all about to come crashing down. And the way he handles it is he drives to his parents' house and he kills his parents and their dog. Oh. And then drives back to his house what? and kills his family, takes sleeping pills, and then lights the house on fire. But firefighters were able to get to him and pull oh. him out before he could take his own life. And so after he regained his strength, he was taken into custody and he made a confession. He was convicted of murder in 1996 and given a life sentence. But in 2015, he became eligible for parole. What? And in 2019, he was released. <laughs> What is going on, bro? This man went and killed his parents and they dog. And the dog ain't had nothing to do with it. Family. Then killed his whole family. That's stole money. How you get out of jail after that? He got life sentence, but then they let him out for what? Good behavior, bro. He bro. Ki- that's the justice system for you, y'all. This that's <clears throat> you can kill your family, kill your parents. Kill a dog, steal money from people. But have some weed on you and you'll go to jail for longer than that. That's crazy. <sighs> You're strong. Jeez, bro. On we September 6, 2006, right. 51-year-old Susan Kuhnhausen was returning from her job as an emergency room nurse in Portland, Oregon. On the way, she stopped yeah. at a hair salon to get her hair dyed. While she waited her turn, she picked up a magazine and a particular quote stood out to her. It said, I will not live an unlived life. I will not live in fear. At the time, Susan was fighting with her husband, Mike. They had been married for nearly 18 years and their marriage had become toxic. And Susan had finally gotten the courage up to tell Mike she wanted a divorce. And Mike did not want a divorce. And so they had these bitter, awful fights and Susan was just looking for things to latch onto. And this type of quote gave her motivation to follow through with this very difficult decision. About an hour later, with her hair now a slightly different color brown, she hopped back in her car and drove the last couple of miles home to her quiet little neighborhood. She pulled into the driveway of her one-story Cape Cod home with their gray picket fence around it. She went in the back door into their mudroom and right away she saw a note next to the microwave that her husband had left because at this time they were still living together. Hmm. And the note just said, Sue, I've had trouble sleeping. I've gone to the beach. I'll see you in a couple of days. She put the note down and then unlocked the door that led into the house, which was into the kitchen. And as soon as the door opened up, she heard the beeping sound of their security alarm. And then she walked all the way through the house to the front door. She unlocked it, went outside and then checked their mail and then went back inside the house. After she got back inside and had shut and locked the front door behind her, she kicked off her shoes and then began walking across the house towards the kitchen. She got about halfway there when she looked over to her left and she noticed the first floor bedroom that they used as a guest room was really dark and every morning before she left for work she would open all the curtains around the house and so in the evening the sun would come into the house it would be nice and bright and so she's thinking to herself did I forget to open the curtains in that room because it shouldn't be that dark and as she's staring at the room a man she didn't recognize Uh walked out from behind the bedroom door and started walking towards her Uh he was medium height medium build he had a hat pulled down over his eyes Uh yellow rubber gloves on and he was holding a hammer Uh he began walking right towards her for many people the sight of a stranger inside of your home yeah. carrying a hammer would be enough to prompt you to turn around and run out of your house yeah. but not sue she had been an emergency room nurse for the past 30 years and in that time she had done things like crack open people's ribs to massage their hearts she had administered ivs and thrashing patients that were suffering from withdrawals and she and the other nurses she worked with trained regularly in self-defense Uh-oh. because you just never knew what was going to happen in the That's ER. Good. You needed to be ready to slip chokeholds and defend yourself. And so here Sue was staring down this intruder in her house okay. with 30 years of preparation for this. <laughs> oh, I've been waiting on you, boy. She yeah, been waiting. 30 years of preparation. Some I'm, say I've been waiting oh, on you. Oh, let's go. She Sue picked the wrong ran house. at this guy faster oh. than he was coming at her, and it caught him off guard. Mm-hmm. She figured if she could just get up close to him, the power of the hammer strikes would be less. Yeah. And so she rams into him, and she's about 5'5", five five and significantly outweighed him. Yeah. He's about 5'9", maybe 200 pounds. And so she rams him into the wall. He hits her in the head once with the hammer, but it wasn't enough to subdue her or even knock her down. She barely felt it. Yeah. And so she's yeah. 
holding on to him and she's screaming at him, who are you? What do you want? Because there was a part of her that thought, this is a burglary. I'll just give you what you want. But the guy didn't say anything. And so Susan grabbed him and pushed even harder against the wall. And the man would say two words. It was the only two words he said the entire time. And it was, you're strong. And Susan, when she heard that, it was like an adrenaline rush. Mm -hmm. She knew this guy was not trying to rob her. Right. He was just trying to kill her. And she thought, no, I'm going to live. And she managed to wrestle the hammer away from him while good. pinning him against the wall. Damn. And then smashed him in the head three times with this hammer before he managed to get it back. But when he reached for the hammer, she grabbed his throat and began choking the life out of him. Oh! The man immediately went for his throat to get her hand off of him, so he was not trying to attack her. And Susan realized that she had him on the defensive. And she grabbed tighter and tighter around his throat. She moved her other hand up and really started Damn. crushing his windpipe. And then she screamed at him. I'll call an ambulance if you tell me who sent you. And the man looked at her and just grunted at her. And so she continued to squeeze harder and harder until his face turned purple and his eyes rolled back. And she knew as an emergency room nurse, if she continued, she would kill him. Yeah. And she wasn't really prepared to do that. And so she threw him to the ground. She turned and began to run towards the front door. But this guy jumped up and leapt after her, grabbed her by the ankle and tripped her to the ground. When she landed, she rolled over onto her back and right on top of her is this guy wielding the hammer. He's about to bring it down on her. And so she instinctively just shot up. She sat up as fast as she could and she bit down as hard as she could on the inner part of his upper leg. Ooh. She bit so hard, she tore through the fabric. And the guy screamed out in pain no! and hit her with the hammer. He began staggering back, at which point she released the bite, got up onto a knee, and then bit him again on the side of his rib cage as hard as she could, Damn. once again tearing through the fabric. Oh. And so now this guy is howling at the top of his lungs, at which point Sue grabs him and throws him to the ground, but mm. she falls with him and she lands directly behind his back. And he's still trying to grab her and he's got the hammer and he's trying to hit her. And so she reaches out and puts her arm uh -oh. over his throat oh, and it. puts him in a wicked chokehold, one it. that he was not getting out yeah. of. And so the guy is trying to fight and get his neck out that's of the chokehold. But it. Susan decided that this guy, he's not going to talk. He's not going to tell me what he wants. Yep. He's here so to I'm kill go. me. That's so it. I'm going to kill him first. And she proceeded to choke him to death. And once he stopped moving, she calmly stood up, looked down, knew he was dead. She grabbed his hammer and then calmly walked out the front door, walked to her neighbor's house, knocked on the mm. door. And then her neighbor comes up and sees Sue just standing there with her clothes tattered and she's all bruised and bloody. Damn. But she Damn. looks like she's totally okay. And the neighbor asks Sue, you know, what are you doing? What's going on? Why do you have that hammer? And Sue would tell her that, well, I had an intruder and he tried to kill me, so I killed him. And I need to use your phone to call the police. And so her neighbor's like, okay, come on in and use my phone. And so Sue walks in with her hammer in hand and calmly calls the police and tells them what happened. Police and paramedics show up and they go inside of Sue's house and they confirm that her attacker was in fact dead. And her attacker turned out to be 59-year-old Ed Haffey, who was a Vietnam veteran with a long rap sheet. Wow. They discovered Ed's backpack inside of Susan's house, and in it was a notebook that contained instructions for what to do after he killed Susan. Mm. And one of those instructions was to call Mike. It turns out this Mike Wait. was Susan's husband. He had paid Ed $50,000 to kill yep. his wife. 50, and Mike, 000. earlier in the day, had gone to the house and allowed Ed in and told him where to go and where to wait. And then on his way out, he had written that note saying, I'll see you in a couple of days. When police brought Mike in, he initially denied all charges and said he had nothing to do with this. But he would eventually confess and then would be sentenced to seven years in prison for soliciting to murder seven. his wife. Damn, Although it? Mike never gave his exact motivations for why he actually did this, he would have been ruined financially during this divorce. But if Susan were to die, he would inherit the house. Immediately after his sentencing, Susan sued Mike for a million dollars, claiming she wanted to make sure he didn't have any more money so that he couldn't go hire another hitman to finish the job. Susan didn't have to worry for very long, though, because Mike would die shortly thereafter in prison. As for Susan, she never faced any criminal charges and, she and in fact was know. hailed as a hero in the Fact. wake of the attack. Hey, man. That's what I'm talking about, Sue, uh, man. That's why it's good she, to know mm -hmm. a little something. And hey, don't just man. sit there and get caught in the crossfire. Crossfire, man. You better do something. Hey, I, she was on her Liam Neeson. Oh, shit. yeah, bro. She wasn't having that. I have that. a particular set of skills. <laughs> I'm not afraid to use them. Right. <clears throat> and she used them. She gave For him real. a chance. She gave him the beat. Once she, she got him in that choke, I was like, well, I'm taking you That's to the king. You're going to meet it. the king real soon. <laughs> <laughs> Once you get in that chokey, 
Yeah, bro. She tried. Yeah, bro. I, 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 I'm with it. As hey, I'm all for people protecting themselves, defending mm-hmm. themselves, uh, themselves, especially women. And I'm glad she knew what to do. She wasn't afraid, and she handled business like a how badass. He, how he gonna call, hire somebody to kill his wife, bro? Boy, it's a sick, bro. It's sick, bro. But Damn. hey, karma is a thing, cause. See, yeah, he didn't even get heads. out of jail. Mm-hmm. He didn't even get out of jail, man. So think about that. Think about the Sky King. All right, this Richard Russell, Russell better wow. known as Bebo by his friends and family, was born in 1989 in Key West, Florida. But at the age of seven, he moved to Wasilla, Alaska. He okay. was a standout athlete at Wasilla High School, competing in football and in track and field. After graduating in 2008, he moved to Coos Bay, Oregon, where he briefly attended a community college. While he was there, he met a woman named Hannah Straysner, and in 2011, they got married. And shortly after that, they opened a bakery that they would run together for three years. Hannah, who had gone to culinary school, was very detail-oriented and ran the show at the bakery. Bebo, on the other hand, was not professionally trained and was much more laid back and interested in experimenting with new and wild recipes. In 2015, with heavy hearts, they decided to sell the bakery so they could move to Seattle and be closer to Hannah's family. Once they arrived there, Bebo got a job at the SeaTac airport as a ground service agent for Horizons Airline. It was not a job he necessarily wanted, but they needed the cash. Mm -hmm. After working at Horizons Air for four years as a ramper, someone that moves the luggage in and out of the aircraft, Bebo was given some additional responsibility. They asked him to be on a two-person tow team. A tow team is in charge of moving airplanes around in yep. between their flights. Mm-hmm. And so the way this works is one person goes down and drives the actual tow vehicle mm-hmm. and hooks that up to the airplane and begins moving it around. And the other person would go up into the cockpit, turn the plane on, and then work a couple of very basic systems to help get the plane to go where it needs to go. Mm-hmm. The members of a tow team are one of the very few number of people that are allowed to go into the cockpit of an aircraft by themselves. And so Bebo really relished this opportunity Opportunity. And when he was up there, he found himself fascinated with all the controls and any chance he got, he would ask a pilot if they were inside of the aircraft to teach him what some of these controls were. But one time Bebo was flipping some of the switches in the cockpit that he was not supposed to touch Uh-oh. that other pilots had told him about. And the pilot of this particular plane caught him doing it, took exception to it, yeah. and reported him. Of but course. surprisingly, there were no repercussions. Wow. It was just really embarrassing <clears throat> for Bebo. Like many of the other ground service agents working at Horizon Airlines, Bebo was generally unhappy with his job. He felt like it was boring, that there wasn't much upward mobility, and that he was criminally underpaid. But there was one redeeming quality of his job, and that was in virtue of working for an airline, he got all sorts of free airfare. And so not only did he get to fly for free all over the world, he got to fly basically anytime he wanted Mm -hmm. up to Alaska to visit his hometown and see his family, something that that was very important to him. The people that knew Bebo said he had a great sense of humor, he was extremely friendly, and you could always catch him with his head buried in a book. And his coworkers would say he had aspirations to be an officer in the military. And when all those people that knew Bebo the best were asked why do you think he did what he did on August 10th 2018 none of them have an answer Mm -hmm. on that fateful day Uh at 1 35 p.m local time a passenger airplane owned by Horizon Airlines flew into SeaTac Airport where Bebo worked and so this plane was not scheduled to fly for the rest of the day so it was taxied to the far north section of the airport to a parking spot called Cargo 1. At 7 15 p.m that evening Bebo arrived at Cargo 1 and he climbed inside the empty aircraft and made his way into the cockpit. He followed the startup procedure until the plane was on and the propellers were starting to turn. He hopped out of the plane got in his tow vehicle and used it to turn the plane around so its nose was pointed towards the airfield. Oh, he moved no. the tow vehicle out of the way and then climbed back inside the aircraft oh, shut it behind him and got in the cockpit and began taxiing out towards the runway. For the next few minutes, air traffic control bombarded Bebo over the radio, asking him, what are you doing? This is unauthorized movement. You should not be heading towards the runway right now. But Bebo never responded. Instead, he just continued on until he reached the beginning of the runway, at which point, despite having no flight experience, minus some video games and fiddling with some switches in the cockpit while he was in the tow team, he managed to go full throttle and get this plane careening down the runway and successfully took off. But that was nothing compared to what he did next. Over the course of his one hour long flight, he expertly performed backflips and barrel rolls and huge loops in the sky. What the hell? Hey bro, he 
he got the simulator at home. You know, we was t- checking it out a few yeah. months back. The little flight simulators the where they have all the contraptions, the buttons, the screen. He thought he knew what he was doing. He was like, I've been waiting for this moment my entire I can, life. I can do this. They on they on flight tower control. They're like, hey, man, what are you doing, Bebo? Bebo, get your ass out the... Chill, Bebo, <laughs> chill. God damn it, he's in there. <laughs> <laughs> Just threw the to, papers on the easy there. We're going to have to shoot him down. Jeez. <laughs> oh, dangerous maneuvers that even expert pilots might risk stalling the plane and crashing. But he didn't. It was like he'd been doing this his whole life. Onlookers on the ground were okay. shocked to see this passenger airline performing these ridiculous stunts so low to the ground. Yeah. That all over Seattle, you had people filming this plane and posting it to social media. Oh. So in wow. real time, it was like the world was made aware of Bebo up in the sky. And so people went outside and just watched as he flew around. But the real story is not the aerial stunts that Bebo was pulling in the sky. It was the strange, calm conversation that Bebo had with the air traffic controller the whole time he was up in the sky. The extremely professional, very calm air traffic controller tries to convince Bebo yeah. that he really needs to come down and land this aircraft. So we he begins it telling him where he can go, different airfields, and if he needs to, he can land out in the Puget Sound. But Bebo kind of laughs it off and says, you know, I wasn't really ever trying to land this plane. I just wanted to do a couple maneuvers before I put it down. And so as Bebo soared through the sky, this controller tried- Bro, that's a huge plane to be Yeah, doing, it is. Doing spins, Flips cargoes, that. bro. That's- That's not one of them two-seater planes. Yeah, bro. He's doing that with a passenger plane. Like, it's nothing. That's crazy, bro. And he's just, uh, uh, traffic control. No, I don't think I'm going to land it right now. Yeah, no. uh, I'm still doing do. a couple of barrel rolls, um, but- uh, Appreciate the the call though. All right. Uh, I've I'll, seen this flippy flippy do bye bye. I wanted to try before I go bye bye. Yeah. He's <laughs> in vain to convince Bebo to stop what he's doing. And Bebo's just completely ignoring him and cracking jokes with him and telling him how he just loves the scenery up there and how beautiful it is. And then at one point, Bebo becomes remorseful and he says to the controller that he really hopes he hasn't ruined his day and he feels really bad for the people that he's inevitably going to hurt. And what? then in Bebo's most poignant moment, he tells the controller that he's just a broken guy and he's got a couple of screws loose and he didn't know it until now. Towards the end of the flight, Bebo tells the controller that he's gonna try for one more barrel roll and if it goes well, he's gonna go nose down and call it a night. The controller Whoa! tries to convince him that it's still possible to try to land, but at this point, Bebo's not listening. At 8.45 p.m., the nose of the plane was seen pointed straight oh. down at the earth. One minute later, at 8.46 p.m., Bebo intentionally crashed into a small island off the coast of Seattle. Wow. He was the only fatality in the crash. Here is a condensed oh, version of some of the commentary between Bebo and the air traffic Easy controller, nobody along else with some out. of the real footage of him flying still, the plane. Gee. I just kind of want to do a couple maneuvers to see what it can do before I put it down, you know? Approach welcome, final runway 16, right? Welcome. Man, I'm a ground service agent. I don't know what that is. There is the uh, the oh. runway just off your right side in about a mile. Do you see that? Yeah, I wouldn't know how to land it. I wasn't really planning on landing it. I got a lot of people that care about me, and uh, it's going to disappoint them to, to hear that I did this. Um, I would like to apologize to each and every one of them. Wow. Um, just a broken guy. Got a few screws loose, I guess. Never really knew it until now. I think I'm, uh, I think I'm gonna try to do a barrel roll. And if that goes good, I'll just go nose down and call the night. Oh man. Wow. How Bebo was able to take off and fly around and pull these stunts without any formal training remains a mystery. Yeah. Some people believe he was planning this for a long time, I had to. which is why whenever he was in the cockpit, when he was in the tow team, he would ask pilots to explain the different mm -hmm. switches and toggles and how to use them. And he would feign that he was just curious when in reality, he was actually trying to learn how to fly the plane. As for the incredible stunts he was doing, it's believed he did learn those in a video game. But even mm -hmm. if this is true, that he learned how to fly a plane by asking a couple questions and playing video games, the chances of it working out and actually Still successfully impressive. taking off and doing what he did are astronomically Probably, low. Yeah. Normal people can't do that. And that's why the internet gave Bebo a new nickname to commemorate the fact that basically no one could have done this but him. 
and so they named him the Sky King. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments ah, what it bro, is and that where you found it. So wild. That was wild. crazy, bro. Yo, this man literally was doing all types of tricks and stuff. Like, it was nothing. Like, he's been doing it in a passenger life. plane, bro. Bro. Oh, that's man. ridiculous, bro. Ah, damn. Well, I, I'm, I'm, piece of him, though. I'm glad he didn't try to take nobody else yeah. out. I'm, I'm, I, I, it's still unfortunate that that even happened. And, you know, he just felt so, you know, broken or whatnot, you know, and uh, that's why we, we always we try to, to you know, try to, you know, promote positivity. And, you know, if you know someone that's going through something, try to help them out, try to mm -hmm. get them to talk to somebody, pay attention to the signs. The signs are usually there. We yeah. just sometimes seem, seem to ignore them. Because it's a lot of broken people, bro. Like it's oh, a, facts. It's really a lot of broken people, man. And it's like we all we all are trying to figure it out, mm -hmm. you know, so I know we joke and stuff sometimes, but yeah. we also need to try to come together in as many times and as many ways as possible, bro, because it's a lot of, everybody has something going on. Mm -hmm. But uh, nah, man, if y'all enjoyed that video, man, as much as we did, yeah. we're going to have to get some popcorn or something. Yeah, next time, we definitely have to I, get oh, some popcorn, I'll be in this mother like, wait, what yeah. <laughs> who, who did what? Damn, but, uh, this was a good one, though. Mr. Ballin, definitely dope at what he does, man. Mm -hmm. Again, as usual, make sure y'all go support <laughs> him. Make sure y'all keep on running with the likes and subscription for our videos. Let us know what else y'all want us to check out after. We do part six. Mm -hmm. We're going to continue this series. Uh, but yeah, we love y'all. Keep on supporting us, spreading love, and being that same love, man. It never goes unnoticed. We in the clutch, baby. Already. This bitch is from Houston. If you got a problem, then we got the solutions. And there's no illusion. I made this shit happen. I'm living life lucid. I'm switching my strategies. Now they hate on me because I'm causing casualties. But why are they after me? Deep inside, they know they can't handle half of me.